Welcome to Future Histories. My name is Jan Gross and it is my great pleasure to welcome Yevgeny Marozov in today's episode. He is a researcher and writer as well as founder of the knowledge curation platform The Syllabus. Regular listeners will know that I highly appreciate his work. Time and time again, Yevgeny succeeds in pushing our thoughts further through his very thorough research and sharp thinking. So you can imagine that I was and still am quite excited to have the chance to welcome him as a guest in Future Histories. In many ways, this couldn't be more fitting. And there is an exciting announcement to make related to me and Yevgeny recording this episode because a transcript of this episode will be featured in an upcoming book I co-edit together with Christoph Sorg. It's an edited volume called Creative Construction, Plant Economies in the 21st Century and Beyond, and it will be published with Bristol University Press. I am absolutely thrilled about the fantastic group of people that are coming together for this edited volume. There are contributions by Laura Horn, Jakob Heyer, Samia Mohammed, Nick Dyer Witherford, James Muldoon and Dougie Booth, Simon Schaub, Stefan Meretz and Simon Sutterlüthi, Heide Lutosch, Rabier Befelde and Philip Möller, Samuel Decker, K.N. Harilal, Gabriele Winker and Matthias Neumann, Savina Schauduri, Rashad Williams, There will be a chapter by Elena Hofferbert, Matthias Schmelzer and Cedric Durand. Christoph Sorg will of course provide a chapter as will I myself. And there will be transcripts of two conversations, one between Nancy Fraser and Christoph Sorg and one, you guessed it, between Yevgeny Morozov and myself. I can promise you that this is not the last time you'll hear me be absolutely excited about this book. Right now, the release is scheduled for May 2024. And be assured, I'll keep you updated on that. Now that I have uh, so shamelessly indulged in self-promotion for the last few minutes, let me be equally excited about an upcoming project by Yevgeny. It's a podcast series written and presented by Yevgeny himself, and it's called The Santiago Boys, and it's described as a wild tale of how Salvador Allende's engineers dared to challenge corporations and spy agencies and almost won a battle for the very soul of information technology. You'll find a link to the very stylish website of the Santiago Boys podcast in the show notes. On the website, you'll find a trailer and in order to stay updated until its release this summer, you can subscribe to a newsletter. Yevgeny has worked on this podcast series for quite a while now and has already been an expert on the topic before that. So we can all look forward to a surely exciting approach to the topic. I for once am thrilled and looking forward to listening to this podcast this summer. Before we finally start, I would like to welcome Saskia as a patron of Future Histories and I'd like to thank Urs, Lukas, Wilfried, Fabian, Georg and Karl for their kind donations. And now, please enjoy today's episode with Yevgeny Marozov on Discovery Beyond Competition. <music> welcome Yevgeny. Glad to be here. There's a lecture you gave at Berkeley titled Beyond Competition, Alternative Discovery Procedures and the Post-Capitalist Public Sphere. And you start the lecture by hinting towards the, and I quote you here, inability of the left to make sense of digital technologies and what to do with them. And then you continue that in your view, the left has a problem with making sense of its own project. And related to that, you ask, and I quote you again, What should their future be other than just defending the welfare state and insisting that they can humanize capitalism? End quote. So I'm, of course, very much interested in both of these tasks, making sense of a possible broader project of the left, as well as making sense of the role of digital technologies for such a project. What are the main challenges surrounding both of these tasks and how are they related to each other? Well, it's a lot to bite, uh, so I'm not sure how we're going to tackle it. The, 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 so probably these issues will pop up as we speak, but uh, 
So that lecture, I think, was almost two years ago that I gave it. So uh, I, I think, you know, my thinking always evolves and it probably has evolved since then. Uh, I haven't gone back to celebrating the left as the <laughs> kind of the, the source of forward progressive thinking on matters of technology. So that hasn't changed. But to 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 answer your question, I think let's try to tackle them separately. Let's first tackle some of the problems on, of, of the left, and then we, we can talk about technology because I think ultimately the, the reason why the left has not been able to come up with a more exciting plan for how to use technology and technologies is because it, it, it kind of got stuck in a certain... Uh, intellectual, political trap, if you will, right? So before we get it out of that trap, I don't think that any forward thinking about technology would emerge. So um, do you want me to, I mean, I, like I, I can go on. Yes, of <laughs> course. I don't know, like, do you really want me to try to lay it out? Because yes, of course. That's why I'm asking. Ah. <laughs> No, no, because it's a huge question. I mean, it's a question about which you can probably write 10 books and you, you can have an entire uh, book imprint of Versa books dedicated just to that question. So, um, fine, let me start because it's so abstract that I I, I feel like I, I might not, I might not land if I jump off that plane. <laughs> you can <laughs> try. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, fine. So let, let me try to outline it. So traditionally, I think the left has inherited this idea, or at least the radical left, that's not liberal Keynesian left, has inherited this idea that somehow um, its task is to figure out how to deploy the tools of planning and uh, all the associated knowledge, techniques, and repertoires in order to show that um, the market does a suboptimal job at allocating resources, right? So the project of the left has been essentially, uh, and again, I'm not talking about Keynesians, I'm talking about kind of hardcore left, the project has been to show that you can build alternative rationalities of allocating goods and resources that would beat the rationality of the market. Uh, and to some extent, uh, you know, it has been done uh, with various success in places like the Soviet Union, partially, of course, uh, by relying on all sorts of um, techniques like input-output method and, and, and whatnot. And uh, the temptation within that tradition, of course, is to think that now that we have more tools and techniques of organizing knowledge, including those of big data and artificial intelligence, we should essentially try to recover uh, that focus on allocating goods and resources and turbocharge it essentially, uh, with these new techniques, and to show and prove to the liberal, to the neoliberals, if you will, who have shifted the, this debate into this knowledge-intensive uh, dimension, uh, thanks to people like Hayek and before him, Mises. And the objective is to show them that essentially they got it wrong, that market is suboptimal and that there is a better way to do it and we can have a better allocative rationality, if you want to put it that way. Um, this is what I think is what some of the most tech-friendly leftists uh, imagine the task of the left to be. Um, I, for one, remain skeptical that this task should um, retain the focus that it has retained within that cohort. Um, I don't even think that it's a mainstream focus of the left, to be honest. I mm. think that the left uh, that has not opted for Keynesianism has opted for some kind of Hayekian view that markets are better at organizing knowledge and that maybe we should just focus on somehow cleaning up afterwards. And the left that is still thinking about something uh, that goes beyond the market or some kind of Keynesian uh, multiplier 
is kind of trying to recover and improve and turbocharge the toolkit of Soviet planning. Uh, me, I've been thinking about these issues for quite a few years now, and the conclusion I've reached, which I don't think I'm going to lay out in full in this conversation because I'm still working on finishing a book. I've started on this. So it's kind of uh, thinking in progress. Even though I know the answer, I will like keep the suspense um, and, and not give you what I what I really think about all of these issues. <laughs> but ultimately, the conclusion I've reached is that there is so much more for the left to do with these technologies if only it slightly tweaks the initial question with which it starts this operation. And the question with which it starts this operation now, I think, is still primarily focused on how do we satisfy human needs and the needs that are basic. How do we make sure that people get fed? How do we make sure that people get enough adequate housing? How do we make sure that all of these basic needs are satisfied? There is, of course, a huge debate on the left. How do you count needs? How do you quantify them? How do you qualify them? Are they transhistorical? Are they permanent? Do they change? That's a whole debate of its own, and I don't want to take any position in that debate in this conversation. But ultimately, I think as long as you retain your focus within this needs paradigm, if you will, you are not going to ask truly exciting questions that will allow you as a leftist to win over the neoliberal camp and their uh, vision of the market. Because their vision of the market is no longer about allocation of goods as it was at the very beginning of this debate, which we, some of us and people on your podcast would know it probably already fairly well, which is the, the, the big event that starts it as the so-called socialist calculation debate, where the discussion is primarily about which of the two systems does a better job of satisfying the needs of the populace, right? whether it's the market or whether it's the plan. Um, I don't think that the neoliberals are still arguing about needs, even though the leftists still are arguing about needs. The ne for neoliberals of the most sophisticated kind, the market became something else entirely. It's a way of organizing the journey into the unknown, as Hayek writes about competition in one instance, it's a way of uh, uh, assuming and allowing more complexity into our social affairs. For someone like James Buchanan, it's even an instrument of becoming and of allowing people to discover who they really are and who they want to be. Uh, it's no longer about satisfying basic needs. And this, I would argue, is what accounts for the buy-in and legitimacy of the market as a tool of organizing society. Because for the kind of more sophisticated end of the neoliberal debate, markets are not tools of organizing economies. They are infrastructures of organizing civilization. Um, and as long as the left doesn't present an equally powerful vision, of its infrastructure for organizing civilization and not just allocating raincoats and uh, you know uh, beds, uh, it will never be able to defeat neoliberalism, at least ideationally. Uh, so this is the background. We can jump into any of these points, but this is sort of how I see it. I didn't yet give you any hint, at least in, in this remarks, as to what this alternative project of the left might be. But I do think that the fight that the left is fighting, it, it has no opponent because the neoliberals have moved on and so has probably the general public. So much of this discussion about how you can satisfy basic needs using AI and Walmart and Amazon-like planning, it's a debate that I'm not sure anybody on the right uh, of the sophisticated neoliberals who have engaged with socialist calculation debate even needs to hear. Because these people, if you read them, if you read even somebody like Buchanan writing about computers in the early 1990s, he will tell you point blank, yes, yeah, sure, computers can maybe mm -hmm. arrive at a perfectly planned economy, but computers will still not give you the possibility of 
exploring who you truly are and of unearthing this becoming and discovery element that the market does. And this is why socialism will never win. I mean, this is their argument. But what I'm saying is that the answer of the left with regards to big tech and AI and cloud computing and infrastructures has to provide an answer to that critique and not just to the critique of, well, we can allocate raincoats better by using Amazon-like warehouses, warehouses methods. That, to me, it's not that relevant. Okay, maybe uh, let's try to pick this apart a bit, because I'm uh, wondering to what degree we're talking about a successful myth so to speak, a narrative on the part of uh, the neoliberals and uh, to what degree we're talking about an actual ability to bring about something new. Because depending on what we're talking about, we have to address uh, or we, we might have to bring up different um, alternative solutions, you know, yep. because I'm to a certain degree uh, wondering why we should accept this Hayekian myth um, as a starting point in the first place, since it's so extremely uh, narrow and somewhat uh, kind of easy to disprove, I would say, by pointing to the many inventions that are not really based on monetary incentives and market competition, etc. And uh, when it comes to the public imaginary, for example, it seems that like non-market-based discovery is somewhat firmly being recognized within a broader public imagination uh, as well, I would say. I mean, the, the stereotype inventor in novels, films and comics, etc., uh, used to be more of a uh, intrinsically motivated uh, nerd figure and not the business type uh, who, who primarily seeks profit and I would say that this um, like uh, business type in the liberal version of things only comes into the picture afterwards when the, the invention kind of has to be uh, brought to the market, so to speak. Um, sure. But if this is the case, but if, if discovery is not really the problem because we have these intrinsically motivated nerd types, then this would mean uh, that we... that. What we need most is not so much a new mechanism for the discovery of things, but an alternative mode or alternative modes of allocating funds and democratizing investment, etc., in order to then bring about effectively the, the huge potential for the new, so to speak, that seems to be a somewhat inherent feature of uh, human potential, you know. And uh, on a worldwide scale, for example, this potential is extremely untapped since, for example, venture capital has a extreme bias uh, uh, with regard to flowing money to their own kind, regardless of uh, actual ability. So I would be interested, is, uh, is it, is it a, a narrative that we are combating in this case, or is it an actual ability of market competition to really bring about the new? Well, I mean, you're framing it in a certain way, and I'm not sure that these are the only options in this debate, meaning that uh, I understand what you're saying, um, but I don't think that the focus on invention is necessarily the correct one, because the whole point of linking it and lumping it was becoming is that you can also account for the consumer side of things and not just for the inventor side of things. So on the consumer side of things, the argument that neoliberals would make is that having the market as the infrastructure of modernity is what precisely allows you to discover what you really want to express your needs and to eventually have them satisfied in a way that has not been done before because these needs were not even in your head. So you can, of course, argue that there are all sorts of ways to do it differently. And of course, there are. I'm just saying that it's not a story of the it's not just the story of the Schumpeterian entrepreneur inventing something in the garage. I mean, mm -hmm. there are bigger things at stake here. I think with regards to the uh, story told by neoliberals, if you account for both the consumption side and the production side. And if you account also for a very important element of it, which is scale, because ultimately the story that somebody like Hayek would tell you is that, sure, you can have solidarity and altruism in a small community in a village where everybody mm -hmm. knows each other. But as you start scaling things up and you have urbanization and modernization, it becomes very hard 
to scale this stuff. So the additional factor in the neoliberal story, of course, is the process of modernization that, you know, yes, you have what Hayek would say, the cash nexus, uh, that now penetrates and intermediates everything in a way that wasn't there before, but it brings with it certain benefits of which this ability to kind of live in a modern world where things are discovered and where there is new that's produced by the behavior of both consumers and entrepreneurs, uh, it's there. Like, do I think this story is um, partly accurate? Yes. Do I think that's the only way in which you can account for different alternatives to different possibilities of becoming and discovery and scaling up the process of modernization in a way that bypasses the market? Of course, I think it's possible. But the way I think to go about it is not to dismiss the story told by the neoliberals is to instead to historicize it and to say that, look, guys, you have mm. a story that emerges from the Cold War. Uh, you set up your two punching bags or your punch, one punching bag in this case, which was the state or the central state and uh, sort of Keynesian liberals play the supporting cast role every now and then because you could always pick them, pick, pick on them and say, look, these guys are almost communists. So if you <laughs> let them uh, play with their monetary policy and if you let them play with government spending, eventually we'll all be like the Soviet Union. So it's kind of one and a half punching backs, if you really want to be accurate. Um, but why are they the only options, right? And this is where you really start understanding that um, you can have a more sophisticated a more sophisticated type of society. So you can have more complexity, you can have more social coordination among people and actors and institutions that were not in touch before that doesn't at all require any mediation by the price mechanism and the price system. Uh, because if the argument made by the neoliberals is that essentially you need the price system so that people can come together and start coordinating things, and coordinating their needs and understanding what's available, what's not available, why not just do it directly? And if you can do it directly, and we do it directly all the time, we do it directly in families. You know, when you need to coordinate with your spouse or partner about picking up kids from a kindergarten, you don't organize an auction and you don't appeal to intellectual property rights and you don't create a market and that behavior, you just send a message over WhatsApp or any other type of infrastructure and you basically coordinate how to make something happen that before that was just a virtuality or uh, was just a hypothetical possibility. And uh, with some basic information exchange, it becomes a reality and an actuality, right? That happens all the time. And that should prompt some questions in our mind as to what are the prerequisites and possibilities for scaling this up and making them richer and making sure that the types of social coordination that are possible in the market are also possible in other domains of life. And maybe they need the funding and the infrastructures and the kind of risk-free environments in which to develop. And this, what I think needs to be essentially this is the argument that needs to be used against neoliberals. It's not to say that the market doesn't do it, but what we have to, what I think we should do is to essentially accept it and say, yes, the market does it, but it does it with huge costs, first of all, and these costs are not fully accounted for by the neoliberals themselves very often. Uh, and uh, it's not the only way to do it. And the organizing religious myth at the core of neoliberalism is that you only have two options, the market and the state. And there is nothing else in between. And if you don't do the market, you'll eventually end up in the gulag. And that's just not the story. Right? And then, of course, you, you have all sorts of perversions. Yes, you can have Elon Musk taking a lot of money from the government and blah, blah, blah. But ultimately, you're never, you're never going to win that rhetorical fight. Because I think broadly, the story, with a few bad exceptions that receive a lot of bad press, the story told by neoliberals, to some extent, is partially correct. Yes, you can have a bunch of small entrepreneurs who essentially don't really, who can treat everything as a black box. Because the market system and the price system allows them to. They don't need to know why there is an earthquake in Sri Lanka 
or why there is uh, suddenly, you know, a bunch of refugees landing and driving up the prices of shelter accommodation. They don't care why. They just need to know where the price will be moving. And since the price will be moving, they can take action and other counterparts can take other action. And yes, you can run society as a black box. And by running it as a black box, you can essentially coordinate effectively with all sorts of, to use in your classical economics, externalities. And uh, do we really need them? And maybe we don't. And if we don't need them, then the question becomes, what other alternatives and possibilities and infrastructures of social coordination, discovery, and becoming do we need? Once you pose the question that way, then you really need to have a good answer as to why that program should be a priority and not the program of satisfying basic needs by giving everybody a coat and a, you know, and a bad bunk. Okay, so um, I guess now the obvious question is, what are the mechanisms, Selkini? <laughs> what are the mechanisms, the infrastructures, etc., that we need mm -hmm. to bring about in order to provide for this uh, type of coordination that is able to also be attractive as an alternative and also, of course, function in this uh, at this level of abstraction that you are describing? The question should be why, like why do you want to do that? Because I think it's a big question. Because if What is the goal? The goal, one goal might be because you want to generate alternative ways of, you want to create alternative ways of generating value, right? Or kind of socialist value that's not capitalist. And you think that you would be able to somehow uh, have people who engage in social coordination with each other, who, who's like, whose social being, if you will, is productive but in a non-capitalist way of something that can then be valorized by society as such and that be used for satisfying the very basic human needs that they're now satisfying through the market. Right? So that would point towards a more, I don't want to say economistic, but a very, let's say, social reproduction-like uh, rationale. Right? So you want to, because unless you pose the question why, Uh, I think you're not going to get a very solid answer. That alternative might be because we think that by facilitating all these ways of engagement, collaboration, coordination, and so forth, we are advancing society forward, and we believe in progress because we are progressive, so some of us are, and we think that it will result in a society that will be many steps above where it was before because we would be able to cure cancer or avoid the next COVID and so forth. This is a somewhat different argument for why that needs to be done. And you can have even other arguments by saying that, well, we think that people should have the capacity to form whatever groups and communities they want and pursue whatever styles of life they want, and we should facilitate that. And part of facilitating that would be providing them with the infrastructure and some kind of opportunities to engage in those different life forms and lifestyles and to pursue them at scale, which to me would be yet a different reason, which would require a somewhat different set of interventions, right? And to some extent, in neoliberal thought, even though they don't do it a very thorough job of explicating that, the market serves all these functions. It's an allocative device because it allocates goods, however imperfectly, It's a device of uh, it's a, de a de device and an infrastructure of seeking and allowing for greater complexity of social interaction, and it's a device which, for better or worse, allows people to withdraw, if you will, and form their own communities and live as they will, with all sorts of constraints and restraints. Right, and there are probably many other functions. And I think that when people on the left are posing this question, they need to understand what part of it they are trying to address. Maybe they want to, to address all three or four, but it's not, I'm not going to give you an answer that from the get-go is going to solve all these problems. Right? All I can tell you is that it seems obvious to me that the basic story accepted by the neoliberals, but also by many people on the left, that the choice is the choice between more market or more state, it's incorrect. You know, there are plenty of ways we coordinate, and you don't even need to look at the examples I gave with 
parents and spouses coordinating over WhatsApp. You know, if you look at a basic school, uh, there is a lot of complexity because there are a lot of pupils and students and teachers and rooms. And that problem of complexity is solved with a very simple device called the timetable, uh, which, as far as I'm concerned, is neither an example of the market nor an example of the state. It's essentially a part of tech infrastructure that greatly reduces complexity and allows for social coordination uh, when none was possible before. We have hundreds of such devices in everyday life, and we have maybe even thousands of them. And the question then is, uh, can we have more? Yes. Can they be more advanced? Yes. Would our life be more complex, more interesting, more sophisticated? and not depend on the market if we had more and if they were more advanced? Yes. And once you answer yes to all of that, then you can start asking questions about how our broader tech infrastructure should look like. What legal facets should it have? What property regime should govern it? How much money should be put into it? I mean, these are the kind of questions I would be asking. To be asking a, a question of what should replace it uh, in the abstract, to me, doesn't make a lot of sense without first posing the questions about why, for whom, and with what purpose. You already mentioned different functions of uh, what markets supposedly can do. What are the, the functions that you think that should be replaced? I think you already hinted towards that maybe all of them could be, re could be replaced, but what are the ones that we pick up, should pick up first? And what then are the concrete infrastructures, the concrete uh, Uh, modes of engagement that we can develop in order to uh, bring about alternative mechanisms. So um, maybe you could give us examples for alternatives that go beyond the timetable that we already know, but maybe um, a hint towards examples that, for example, can be scaled in different forms in order to provide um, modes of engagement that are able to, to replace certain functions of the, of the market. So maybe you could guide us through uh, different aspects of this. Sure. Uh, I mean, look, from the three functions of the market I've outlined and mentioned, it's obvious to me that I am that opposed to making the market the overall infrastructure of modernity, if you will. So I don't want the market to be the tool through which we move and advance forward. I think it's a completely mad bat to do it this way. Uh, so uh, clearly markets should not be instruments of reducing complexity, of organizing uh, different types of coordination among social groups, of allowing uh, new things to be discovered in a structured way. Now, am I against uh, markets as allocative devices in certain limited cases? No, I'm not. I think markets, once they are well-designed, And once they are uh, supervised, controlled, and uh, monitored, they can deliver. With, and you know what to expect of them once you know what to expect of them. And uh, once you monitor for how well they're functioning, you can have them all you want uh, with this very limited, uh, if you will, uh, focus, this very limited agenda. Um, now, beyond that, um, I don't have the great technocratic uh, <laughs> vision because I don't think that the vision here should be technocratic. I think it should be managerial uh, in that. Um, and this is the kind of another dimension that I, I, I didn't really make clear in my previous essays, which I will make clear in the book. Um, so I think of traditional socialist in the European sense uh, of the world, at least, and the kind of European, traditional European social democratic movement, socialism, this workers' movement and communism as well, I think of it as a movement that in the economic sphere seeks simplicity. And planning is one way to get at it. So you really want to make sure that uh, things are under control and that you kind of know what goes where you control the inputs, you can monitor the outputs. It's a system that you might think is complex, but you're trying to make it simple. 
and you're using all sorts of tools, technologies, techniques of knowledge, and so forth to arrive at that simplicity. Um, capitalists, even Keynesians, um, don't have this view. They accept, by and large, that the system is complex. And they think that you can find ways to thrive in the complexity. Um, corporations do that by essentially hiring managers who go through, I mean, I know everybody, people think corporations are run by idiots. I don't. <laughs> uh, I think that uh, good management is a craft and you have to learn it. And it requires all sorts of techniques. I mean, try uh, building a complex uh tunnel somewhere if you do it. I mean, of course, the government does it too. That's not the point I'm making. All I'm trying to say is that something like project management uh, requires a certain skill set, uh, which you develop, and then you deal with complexity. But you deal with complexity without trying to uh, make it simple by reducing it into chunks that your system can digest, uh, which I think... Uh, is the default socialist temptation. Uh, so whatever alternative system we would be building, I would suggest it becomes much more managerial in its outlook uh, than whatever the other equivalent with this insistence on simplicity is and would be. right? And uh, that means that the infrastructures we would need would need to make it easier to manage things uh, so it might need infrastructures of prediction, of modeling, of running simulations, of understanding how the world might be, because that's what managers do. They try to anticipate the world as complex as it is without making it simpler. And I would argue that the socialists have to go even further than that. They have to deliberately make it more complex. So they have to take it upon themselves to make sure that the world is messier, more chaotic, and uh, crazier than it is before they started working. I mean, many socialists succeed in that just because of bad management. But I would argue that that has to be done structurally. And this is what socialism is about. It's about allowing people who want to live in ways that they want outside of the market, outside of whatever mentality and subjectivity is posed on them by this invisible leviathan, as some people call the market, to pursue their projects without hopefully hurting each other, but in a way that allow us to have all this immense variety of behaviors, lifestyles, forms of lives, and however you want to call it, and still making sure that the ship doesn't think. And making sure that the ship doesn't think is what really makes it complex. But this is really where technology, big data, and everything else can help, but not help by planning in the old uh, sense uh, of the world of the world but predicting and managing and then delegating the functions further down the line so that you don't have to centralize all the management uh, in the hands of the politburo now this how it works in the abstract i'm not naive enough to think that in today's geopolitical milieu you can have as much decentralization as I would wish personally. Because even developing all these infrastructures of prediction, anticipation, and management would require the pursuit of probably a far more autonomous technology and science policy uh, that uh, hegemonic powers of today would be happy with. Uh, so uh, it will be a trade-off. So I'm not naively proposing that we just have a bunch of communes interrelated with each other through a giant network. But I think as a kind of, as, as a horizon of where we want to be, that's not a bad vision. In preparation for our uh, conversation today, I listened to the to all of the six uh, Macy lectures uh, by Stefan P on Designing Freedom. And a lot of what you just said 
kind of resonates with some of the ideas that we know from the, the work of Stafford B. And I would like to kind of um, make a link to that because when it comes to examples for large-scale technopolitical infrastructures from the left that have tried to provide alternatives to both capitalist market economies and hierarchical uh, central planning, one particular historical experiment, of course, sticks out in different ways, and that is uh, Project Cybersyn. You've worked on the topic extensively in different formats, among them a soon-to-be-released podcast series that I very much look uh, forward to hearing. I guess many of the Future Histories uh, listeners know about Project Cybersyn, but some might not. So could you, for a start, give us an overview of what Project Cybersyn is and then go into how it is relevant for um, your thinking about alternatives today? It's a good question. Um, I don't think. Well, I mean, I'm going to disappoint you. What? Um, so I don't. I <laughs> so I. I don't think that Project Cybersyn itself is necessarily very relevant uh, because essentially, I mean, if you really want to be honest historically, you have to take it for what it was, and what it was was a system that would allow. Uh, a ministry essentially was state run state corporation to run a bunch of companies that were being nationalized in a way that would in a way that would be scalable mm. so uh that's all it was uh and it wasn't some great insight that we need to move from central planning to managerialism of the kind I was describing they it was just the circumstances were like that they they couldn't move to central planning even if they wanted to and they couldn't exit the market because of the political conjuncture on the ground in chile so they were stuck with these companies buying and selling things on the market but being state companies that needed to be managed uh, in a way that would soon involve the workers and nobody needed nobody really knew how that exactly that would happen right so this is cybersyn this doesn't mean that um, the idea circulating in that milieu uh, don't have anything to recommend us. I think they do. Not necessarily ideas about cybernetics, but ideas about technological dependence and the way in which technology plays a certain role in geopolitical order. And this is actually the focus of my more recent work, looking at Chile and to some extent Brazil uh, of the 60s and 70s. But in Stafford Beer himself, uh, there are many elements that are interesting um, and that I think can and should be integrated with a certain type of socialism. But it's a certain type of socialism that I think itself is in a minority position. Uh, and it's a socialism that really looks at complexity as a good thing. And it tries to embrace complexity. It, it tries to embrace non-neoliberal complexity and live with it and profit from it. And I would say that people like Raymond Williams, for example, who is one of the people who has actually written about complexity in socialism and how socialists should insist on complexity, is somebody who could have had a very uh, interesting engagement with cybernetics. And to some extent, he did. He was a theorist of communication and transport in addition to being a socialist and transportation. Well, more communication, of course, much more than transportation <laughs> and culture. Um, so, um, but having studied Stafford Beer very closely, having spoken to many of his friends and colleagues and family and having spent a lot of time in his archives, I also don't want to overstate the case. Uh, he did not, he was a management theorist who mostly by luck and uh, <laughs> misfortune, probably more than luck, and for him, ended up working in Chile of Allende and that changed his life. But it was not a conscious effort to think through for you know a decade of how do we rebuild socialism uh, through cybernetics. Just, just, just that, that wasn't it. It doesn't mean that there weren't other people who have tried to think this question, and there have been some. But Stafford Beer is essentially a person who 
is a management theorist. And uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot apply his management theory to other domains. And I think that's what happened in Chile. He had a fan club and they reached out to him. But even if they did not reach out to him, they would be pursuing his ideas in government there. I'm absolutely sure. So it's a body of thought that you can apply um, in domains that have nothing to do with corporations. Uh, and I think uh, this is the part of cybernetics that remains relevant. And it's essentially, and I was just reading a project management book the other day. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm reading like really advanced project management books in search for some deeper deeper truth. Uh, and they almost use the same language. They, they talk about variability and they need to control variability where Stafford Beer would be talking about variety reduction and, and things like that. So I think a lot of this man, they talk about buffering. I mean, it's, it's all very cybernetic in its outlook. Uh, so from that end, I think for obvious reasons, the legacy of people like Stafford Beer uh, lives on in the business world, uh, partly because, and this is where I think maybe we agree with, I agree with what you said before, partly because socialist praxis of management and administration hasn't really flourished, even though there have been efforts. I don't know if you know what Steph, Stefano Harney was doing with Queen Mary University in London maybe 10 or 15 years ago. There was an effort to actually take over a business school uh, and reorient it towards leftist kind of Italian autonomous uh, principles. So that these efforts have occurred. And sorry, maybe I shouldn't have singled out Stefano Harney. I don't know if he'll now be hunted down <laughs> by uh, <laughs> somewhere if he's in Singapore, whatever he is. But essentially, uh, yeah, the the, 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 the the socialist praxis has not had a chance to learn from it, in part because there has been a shortage of socialist regimes that would truly benefit from it. Because part of Beer's uh, agenda, if you read those lectures carefully and if you read his books carefully, is of course, sorry, should I, should I get controversial and start talking religion? It's almost like the principle of subsidiarity in Catholicism, you know, where you could basically delegate and like they, you, you want this uh, individual social bodies and units of society to deal with their own problems as much as they can before you involve the church and the state especially the state and it's almost and, you know, and Stafford moved between different religions and eventually he left all of them but at some point he was really profoundly catholic and i think it partly reflects how he ended up thinking about autonomy because for him autonomy inside a company it's that it's making sure that you have these units that are on their own and mind their own business and the higher ups intervene only when something goes wrong and of course it has all sorts of issues with it. And it's one can say it is an appealing vision of how you can organize society in a kind of non-statist form. It's just that the kind of socialists that survived the onslaught of global capitalism against them in the last 30 or 40 years have not been decentralized. But rather, if you look at China, they have been centralized. And one can as well argue that um, had Stafford's ideas in Chile about decentralization and autonomy been implemented faster and sooner, uh, it would have crumbled even earlier than three years in um, the regime of Allende, in part because it would be very hard for such a regime to survive longer than it did without either mobilizing all the power that you have and instead of talking about democracy, giving ordinary people arms, which would have led to a Guatemala-like civil war with hundreds of thousands of people that, or you just forget about all the decentralization and autonomy altogether, and you just have a China-style centralized regime, and uh, you don't have all the benefits of participatory democracy, but maybe you last longer than three years and you avoid the coup. So I think we have to be also a bit historically conscious and pragmatic about this question. But what does this then mean for the alternative that you are thinking about? Because, I mean, uh, both in terms of this relationship between uh, center and uh, centralized and decentralized elements, as well as in uh, with regard to uh, the 
real challenge of not getting crushed, uh, as yes. you just described it. Uh, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so w what does this mean for for the project that you are imagining? Sure, sure. But I think I, I made it clear in my initial remarks that the kind of project I envision would require, for it to survive, it would require still a much more centralized central entity with a very robust science and technology policy, with a very robust intelligence network, with a very robust uh, geopolitical outlook, alliances, and so forth, to survive uh, in order to pursue those reforms and to pursue this project or about that. I have that. zero doubt. I have about that. Um, still, I do think that this utopian vision does need to be communicated and put, uh, at the center of the discussion, because ultimately I don't think that you can win over the population, at least in Western Europe and North America and some parts of Latin America, maybe, uh, with the old socialist ideas and old socialist uh, kind of uh, imaginary. Uh, and without having those people on your side, your project will crumble even sooner. Um, I don't think that that necessarily is the case when you talk about uh, countries that we used to refer to as developing or the global south, where... I do still think that there are still important tasks to be done with regards to industrialization and with regards to essentially making sure that they avoid all the traps of underdevelopment. Uh, and, and where traditional 20th century socialist uh, rhetoric uh, is not just working, but probably is what they need before they can move to this more, if you want to use a fancy word post-industrial kind of imaginary I'm, I'm i'm toying with so do you think about this question of transition in in more concrete terms like what are the 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 elements of power that one needs to think about in order to bring this about so um is this something that you that you think about i mean I don't think we had, I mean, we can think about it. I'm just not sure it's a, it's of any use. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, at this point, I mean, at this point, the question is, you either try to convince the old agents uh, of the left, uh, social democratic parties, trade unions, socialist parties, that this is an agenda worth engaging with, or you just start a somewhat different movement and you try to... I mean, I, we haven't even touched upon the question of class and what kind of class relations emerge from this outlook. And uh, the, 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 there is a can of worms right there. But thinking about the question of transition to me is premature because I'm just not sure that the political agent uh, capable of even initiating that transition is there. And I'm not sure that the current coalition, if you will, that still represents the mainstream left, wants to take this on for all sorts of reasons uh it's just not obvious w w w how you're going to win elections with this program uh a, a lot of things i mean i i think that framed properly you can and to me the number one factor is that um capitalism for all its uh, and markets, you know, how, however you want to frame it, but let's talk about capitalism. Capitalism, for all of the things that neoliberals say, neoliberals say about its ability to coordinate information, promote social coordination, discover new, facilitate becoming, it still does, it, it still exercises so much power about alternative ways of doing things of engaging with the world and each other on ways that are not mediated by the market, of accessing knowledge that gets suppressed and underdeveloped because somebody moves into that domain and grabs all the property rights, intellectual property rights, and doesn't allow others to get in. I mean, the costs of living under capitalism are much bigger than we think they are, just in terms of kind of the imaginary power, imaginative power that we are losing by relying on it to be the central infrastructure of modernity, if you will. And it would have been fine. We could live under this yoke forever, but we also have a climate problem. And ultimately, if we don't solve 
that one, everybody's going to die. And just very simple. <laughs> and to me, that seems like the argument uh, as to why anybody in the right mind should be lining up for a political project that would remove that yoke and not just remove it and replace it with nothing, but will actually target the very area where capitalism is weakest, which I think is innovation. So in that sense, I do think that the main problem with capitalism is that it it forces society to under-innovate, which in a sense is what Marx said of it uh, in his critique. And the point was not that it's bad, it's that it innovates, but then it reaches a certain point at which point class relations block it from innovating further and they're kind of stuck. Right? So you don't have to say that Marxist was an accelerationist. That was the whole point of Marxist critique of capitalism as, as, a, as a kind of as a modern system. And I think back in those days, it seemed that the only thing we were losing was just maybe fancy and better technologies or more efficient ways of organization. But now we're losing our future because we're just going to die in the climate catastrophe. <laughs> And if we don't move, then it will come faster. So in that sense, you may start making new political arguments that will somehow bring themes of knowledge, innovation, climate change, catastrophe, all in one place. But I just don't see, like, it would be very hard. So let's leave aside the hardcore left, like focus on the social democrats. Social democrats accept the mainstream neoliberal story about the markets being good for knowledge. And that they are the perfect systems for knowledge coordination, and they are perfect system for uh, um, essentially make, you, make, making use of all the knowledge that's distributed in society, to, to use one of Hayek's phrases. And it's just false. So for them to accept the story I'm advancing, they'll just need to do some work on themselves and essentially understand that they've made some mistakes. And then there is a space and a way to think about these questions without having to say, no, we are with Stalin and with uh, centralized central planning of, of the Soviet Union. And until they do that, I don't think we should even be talking about transition. It's so interesting to me that you put this aspect of discovery at so much, so much at center stage, because I would, I would, my, my intuition would be that what you already pointed towards, like the ecological question, as well as the question of existential security, those are the ones that um, are, in my view, much more important for a, a broader public, you know, like uh, you could easily argue for a discovery through existential security, since if you simply bring people into the position where they do not have to hustle the whole day uh, in order just uh, to get through, then then there's a huge potential of uh, creativity so to speak that would be set free and uh and and my yeah, yeah but but intellectually yeah no i understand what you're saying and a lot of people have made that case with regards to the welfare state but i just think that intellectually i mean look it's a much bigger battle than a battle between sort of neoliberalism and whatever succeeds the people who were in the socialist calculation debate. Essentially, it's a question, it's, it's a debate about action. You have a theory of action uh, underpinning, I would argue, both neoclassical economics uh, and Austrian economics to some extent, and much of social science, things like rational choice, which is a very simplistic theory of action. And, it, you know, it starts with Weber, who partly borrows it from Menger and a bunch of other economists of the first generation Austrian school. And it goes something like this, you know, we're all rational, we have goals, and then we find the most rational ways of uh, fulfilling them. And then uh, that's it. And if we find a more efficient way of fulfilling them, then this is innovation, right? And the person who does that is entrepreneur. And what it is to be an entrepreneur is to be always on the lookout for the more efficient uh, means of pursuing given ends, right? And that's a theory of action that I would argue, and I'm not the only one making that case, underpins most of the theories of socialism in the actual praxis, 
in the Soviet Union and elsewhere. So, you know, Lange and everybody else, that's how they also think about action. But this is wrong. I mean, this is wrong because it doesn't account for people changing goals along the way. Uh, and it doesn't account for much of the stuff that happens in everyday life. I start doing something, I do it, then I understand I need to do something else and I do it differently. And then I realize it's all wrong. I need to do something else entirely. This is what human action is like. And unless you build a political system that accounts for it, you're going to end up wasting 90% of human potential and human creativity, what really makes us humans as opposed to automatons and algorithms. Because our social system is not optimized to take advantage of the sparks of creativity that really drive us and that make us human. Right? And the only way that our system currently is optimized to do that is by channeling our desires and incentives into the price system. So if I really understand that there is something cool to be done and creative, yes, and I want to share it with others, the only way to do that for me is to become an entrepreneur, start a startup, uh, seek money, and put it on the market. And all I'm saying is that if we were to build an alternative system that would actually account for how humans really are and would require very different theories of action, maybe informed by pragmatism, maybe informed by something else. Like there are tons of, not tons, but some alternatives out there, abduction. I mean, you can account for all sorts of things which uh, mainstream economic and social theory cannot account for. Once you build an appropriate social system for that, then I think the effects and the benefits you're going to harvest will go far beyond what you get by currently making sure that artists have universal basic income or the welfare <laughs> state is generous and are, funds arts. That's what I'm that's what I'm talking about, right? So and in that sense, yeah, I don't think we are there. And I don't think that people on the left are even interested in this question. And I think they completely mm, yeah, well I don't know. You disagree, tell me. Maybe maybe there are some underground uh, circles that I'm not aware of. Well, I mean, I think that people are interested in so far as I think there's a similarity of the way that you pose the problem to a certain kind of um, not disappointment, but yeah, maybe it is a form of disappointment how the debate around democratic economic planning is currently framed. Because in my view, at least, uh, even though I'm very much interested in the debate, obviously, I do think that it's a far too narrow scope that is being talked about in, in within this debate. And in so far, I think there is an interest in going beyond this like fixation on uh, markets as information processes, which is a, a scope that is is not. Um, not not big enough, and the way that I try to approach this is, is uh, through this lens of alternative arts of government, which is a way for me to to ask different questions towards this complex of problems, you know. And for me, for example, uh, this leads to questions of markets as sites of veridiction and production of truth and stuff like that. And then you go, you come to to different, yeah, as I said, a different set of questions and a different set of problems that that we need to kind of engage with and bring up alternative um, ways to approach it. So I would say there is an, <laughs> there is an interest in, in thinking about these things in different ways. I think I do have maybe a different um, timetable in terms of, I would say the first thing would be to provide some form of uni universal basic service and existential security. And then op on top of that, we should build these different kind of uh, in infrastructures of dis discovery, so to speak, um, because I think that they can only be harnessed if the material basis is given for the people who who, who have to have yeah. basically time in order to engage with it. And uh, so this is a different kind of yeah, timeline. You know? but, but I mean, it's not just the timeline. I mean, look, I fundamentally think that social theory uh, accepted in mainstream leftist circles uh, is broken. Uh, and it just is. And it's broken because the theory of action underpinning it is broken. And unless you fix it, you're not going to have a robust theory that will be able to speak about modernity, industrialization, uh, postmodernism, whatever you want. You may say none of it is relevant. We just want to make sure that people have trams and you know enough food to eat. And 
like that's fine. That's a fine perspective to take. It's not either. I just or. don't think. Well, if, sure, it's not either. Yeah, but if it's not neither or, then you're asking for the kind of low-hanging fruit, then. I mean, who is going to argue on the left against universal basic services or universal basic income? Like, constituted in a kind of way that will be welfare state enhancing as opposed to libertarian Friedman-esque, right? So I see it as a kind of, as a default. To me, that's not even an issue, to be honest. To me, the issue is that even if you engage with the German-speaking world, right, and you take somebody like Jürgen Habermas, he is the reference point for German social democracy, like whether you want it or not, right? And so, uh, Habermas does have a theory of action, and the theory of action is very simple. The theory of action tells you the world is getting more and more complex. In that sense, he agrees with Hayek and Luhmann. And he tells you the only way to reduce that complexity is by relying on markets and by relying on law. <laughs> so money and legal system. There is nothing else. And then all you can do is to eventually and sometimes push back against the encroachments of all that complexity on the life world. And you do that through traditional liberal institutions and the media. And that's a story accepted by and large by social democracy. Now, is that story true? I would argue that story is not true for one simple reason, because he is missing the most important mechanism of social coordination and reducing complexity, which is information technology. And that you don't need to rely on uh, money and you don't need to rely on law. You can actually reduce complexity. And once you understand that, then you understand that all sorts of other things become possible. You don't really need to buy all of the bourgeois liberal political institutions we inherited from the French Revolution uh, whole scale. Because you can have people organizing and still having all the complexity that you want and all of the rights that they want, but doing it outside of the traditional money system with banks and uh, a legal system with laws and bureaucracies, right? And I think that unless, and that's just one example. Uh, so unless you go and piece by piece understand what are the blocks, mental blocks and intellectual blocks, we're going to end up reusing and recycling neoliberalism. Because to some extent, for when it comes to non-communicative action in Habermas, that's what he does. <laughs> he takes Hayek and he basically says, yeah, life is getting more complex. But and what I mean by recycling neoliberalism is something very simple. The only way you account for these creative sparks of action that I was describing 10 minutes or five minutes before in mainstream debate is through the concept of entrepreneurship. Right, And now you have to invent all sorts of entrepreneurship. You have moral entrepreneurship, ideas entrepreneurship, cultural entrepreneurship, religious entrepreneurship. Everything is entrepreneurship now because we have no way to account for truly new, creative, non-teleological behavior in domains that are not the market. So we think everything is like the market. So we're going to take the Austrian concept of entrepreneurship from it and insert it everywhere else in social theory and how the world operates. And I think it's just dumb. And that will continue spreading unless somebody stands up and says, look, you're basically rock, uh, working with a wrong concept because the Austrian concept of entrepreneurship doesn't even describe entrepreneurship itself because it cannot tell you about entrepreneurs that suddenly decide to, I don't know, switch from for-profit to non-profit status, pursue social entrepreneurship, or completely change their goals or completely reinvent themselves. You are still tied to the idea that these people need to make something and that they are imprisoned by the price system. And the only innovations they can introduce is in the techniques of production. Right? which is how traditionally they think. So you can switch to a better technology, you can invent something, you, know, you can invent a new product that will be even better than your previous product. So uh, all I'm saying is that I think it's not neither, either or, I, and that I agree with you, but I do think that without completely rebuilding social theory block by block, to account for complex behavior, to account for complex behavior that's not just Santa Fe Institute-like complexity theory, whose whole purpose and raison d'etre, as far as I'm concerned, is to show you that uh, the state can never be as good as the market in uh, kicking off economic processes. Like We need a different complexity. We need a non-neoliberal, 
complexity favorable to the core leftist ideals and ideas. And some of those ideas have to do with a diversity of lifestyle and diversity of life forms producing fantastic social effects that will be disruptive, progressive, and it will move society forward, the kind of effects that we currently attribute to the market. And now you mentioned um, again that one of the tools that we definitely need to use that is in our toolbox but is not yet utilized in order to bring these alternatives about our digital technologies. Can you sketch in a bit more concrete terms how specifically digital technologies can be of use in this task? Yeah, but I, again, you you will find it very banal and feel what I'm going to tell you. That's all right. I, I, no, 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 but <laughs> I just don't think that it's... Look, I'm the kind of guy who 10 years ago was putting the word internet in scare quotes, and I, that's how I put it in my book to save everything click here, because I didn't think that there was such a thing and that it needed to be talked about and be ascribed all sorts of essential qualities as if it was, I don't know, uh, something that is born with this features and characteristics. So in that sense, if one community will be happy to use Abacus and a timetable and another one would want an AI, I mean, uh, great. Like, it's not up for me to tell, like all, I think all we can do as critical intellectuals is to look at the current tech landscape and to see which parts of it make such a project unlikely or not favorable, right? Both in terms of use, because you can say that, okay, these technologies are easy to spy on, they allow surveillance, they, they require people to pay for them with their data, or with money. So you can make a critique based on use and praxis, so to say, or you can make a critique based on what the non-state ownership of these infrastructures in the current economic conjuncture means geopolitically because you want your basic communication education healthcare transportation to be somehow run in a democratic way where the polity decides on how to offer it how to structure it how to reform it which you would not be able to do if you integrate palantir into your you know health data and you will not be able then to kick them back for all sorts of other reasons contractually and infrastructurally right so that this is a different side of this is a different critique that has nothing to do with praxis because you can even buy into it and say that google offers you a fantastic tool like a google calendar great we'll never invent something better right? you can even accept that argument Uh, on the level of use and praxis, but you can then strike it down and strike it out based on the geopolitical meaning of delegating so much power to a foreign company that you cannot control. Right? So see, I think that these are the criteria through which this has to be thought through. But beyond that, I just think you will end up at a level of generality that will tell you that, yes, overall, it's better to have infrastructures that are generative. So you can build on them in an easier way than infrastructures that aren't and that are closed. This is the truth we've learned in the last 50 or 60 years. Is it always the case? No, because there are trade-offs. And some of those trade-offs may have to do with security, with the fact that you just don't have access to technologies because somebody is not selling them to you, which now is happening in, in China with microchips. Uh, and, I, and this is a constraint, and then you have to live with that constraint. So I don't really think that you can arrive at a, beyond that, I don't think you can arrive at a set of more specific, at least I cannot, at a set of more specific normative criteria that you want to have in the stack infrastructure. Because ultimately, it has to be secondary to a political project. And unless you have a political project, this infrastructure is not going to help. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm actually very much looking forward to the way in which you will hopefully uh, lay out this idea in your in your book at some point. Do you know when this will be ready? Good question. Uh, you're not the only one asking me this question. <laughs> uh, so now after two years, I'm almost done with this podcast on Latin America. So I'm getting back to the book. I think that the podcast has helped me a lot to sharpen uh, 
some of my points, uh, particularly with regards to this managerial angle, simulations, modeling, uh, and the role that they can play in alternative leftist project and paradigm. So my hope is to finally finish this book this summer. And if all goes well, should be out next year. Nice. Very much looking forward. Did it bring you, the, the, the podcast project, did it bring you forward in terms of thinking about the political project as well? Um, yes and no. I mean, it was a project very much focused on Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, so in the end, in the 60s and 1970s. And uh, so it's a very different time with the Cold War and multinational corporations and spy agencies. Um, so it it did in, in a sense that you see you see how a lot of the challenges and problems that a country like China is going through right now, for example, when it comes to technological sovereignty and its desire to break from the technological dependence on on uh, on, on, on Western Europe and North America, how these debates uh, already were had in the 60s and 70s and how, in a sense, China is doing what some Latin American countries in the Andean Pact, for example, where Chile and Peru were members in Ecuador, I think, uh, that they tried to do uh, in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Um, so in a sense, yes, I don't think, I mean, you can apply some of those lessons to Europe uh, too, in a sense, but I think I, I, to me, there is really no possibility of a political project without a geopolitical project. So I, I think, uh, if you will, the condition of possibility for the kind of progressive political project that all of us are hoping for uh, as a certain geopolitical situation and a certain geopolitical outlook. Uh, and, and I don't think that we should ignore that, that uh, it would require more a bolder stance vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States, possibly, or at least vis-a-vis -vis Wall Street and Silicon Valley and others. And um, yeah, I, I just don't think that you can have harmony while at the same time pursuing some kind of an agenda that would replace their tech with European tech. Um, I, I don't think it will be easy. And as long as it's realized, then it's fine. Very much looking forward to this book, I have to say. Uh, Evgeny, at the end, I always ask the question, if you think about the future, what makes you joyful? Yeah, I've listened to a podcast. I should have prepared for this question. <laughs> <laughs> what makes me joyful? Uh, I mean, ultimately, I think that there are... Hmm, how should I put it? Hmm. Yeah, you know, I, I don't really know. So it's uh, nothing makes me joyful in the very specific sense because I don't, uh, I, I think optimism is the kind of luxury that we cannot really afford at this point. But let, let, let me think about it some more. Um, well, I mean, I don't want to sound like one of those um accelerationist guys and celebrating the power of technology to solve all these questions. But I do think that if there is a silver lining, yeah, that's the right term, silver lining, to the kind of rise of big tech in the last 10, well, in the last 15 or 20 years, it's that it showed us that so much social coordination is possible in a completely non-market way, and we have not realized it yet. I mean, if you think about all the tools, all the apps, that all these people in Silicon Valley and elsewhere obsessed with productivity, with collaboration and coordination are using, I mean, yes, you might be paying something for them, but what they probably don't realize is that ultimately they're not coordinating through the price system. I mean, they're using the price system to get access to a non-market system of coordination. And Silicon Valley has consistently showing us that collaboration and coordination 
happens outside of the market and with enough money being poured into it, it can become even deeper and better and faster and and, and, and more efficient. And in that sense, uh, that is the best argument against relying on the market to facilitate social coordination a la Hayek that we have seen. And that does make me optimistic, but that requires somebody to see, you know, and if, if the tree falls in the forest and there's nobody to see it. Uh, so if, if people will be able to see that element of it, great. But uh, I think right now, the only thing we have seen in this phenomenon, by and large in the public debate, is the opposite. It's the idea that the non-market, no, the market is so much better than the non-market of building these cool things. And to some extent, I mean, it's not true, but they have built them. But that's not the point, right? The point is what these things allow us to do and what they allow us to do is to completely bypass the market when it comes to coordinating. And as long as you understand that, then, you know, you're far ahead. <laughs> that's so interesting that you frame it this way now at the end again, because I think that, I mean... Um, Leaving aside the too narrow um, focus within the debate, at least this point that you just stated, I think this is absolutely part of the like revived planning debate that there is potential in this in these types of non-market coordination. At least in I mean in future histories, this features definitely features in future histories. I would say no, the the fact that these technologies do provide some form of Alternative coordination. Yeah? Sure, sure, sure. But the question, I think this is Jan, gets us to the heart of it. The question then becomes, what do you need this coordination for? Right? And I think that this is a philosophical question. Mm. And for a lot of people, including, I, I would say, most of the people involved in the democratic planning debate, this coordination is just a way of fulfilling the need to distribute and allocate goods. Uh, by and large, because this is the primary focus, mm -hmm. right? They're not really stepping into the world of discovery, becoming creativity and so forth, because ultimately it's almost like they operate with a muscle or pyramid of some kind, right? And this is what, for many people, that's what, and this is, Marx operates with it to some extent too. So if you look at this kind of, the, the distinction, and I mentioned it in some of my talks, so you heard that the distinction in the realm of necessity, uh, The, 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 what is it? The realm of necessity and the realm of freedom, mm -hmm. right? Ultimately, you, you, even if you want to be 100% just to Marx, you have to acknowledge that he put a lot of effort into thinking about the realm of necessity <laughs> and not enough into thinking about the realm of freedom, right? And in a sense, because maybe it was too far into the future. Maybe it's because it's all, maybe it would just have some kind of a liberal, I'm not saying that's what Marx wrote, but that's one possible interpretation. Maybe we'll have some kind of a liberal interpretation of everybody to their own devices. And as long as we coordinate production in the workshop in a democratic way, what you do when you hunt and drink wine and write poetry in the afternoon, uh, like it doesn't matter. So we shouldn't think about it. And I think that's a mistake. So if there is like one big message I'd like to leave you with is that I think it's a mistake because in a sense, the neoliberals understood it, that it's that element that accounts for the most exciting parts of modernity. So this is the stuff that really gets people excited about technology, cities, urbanization, modernization. It's that part. It's not the satisfaction of basic needs. And they argue that the market is key to satisfying it. So this is one reason why I think the left should engage with planning in the realm of freedom more than it has. Uh, and the second reason is that I do think that the realm of freedom, once organized properly, is productive of value that can then, in a non-Marxist meaning of the term, that can then feed back to satisfy the needs in the realm of necessities. And that's, to some extent, what Silicon Valley has done. They allowed you to do whatever you want in your everyday life, They get all the data through your devices about what it is that you do, and then they monetize it. And then they do whatever they want with that money, right? And so if you really want to have a socialist biopolitics, like that's a good candidate. Reappropriating um, that and making sure that value is generated 
from that, not just individual everyday life, living your life the way you want, but also from collectivity, because we all engage in it collectively. And once analyzed collectively, of course, this data has enormous value when it comes to traffic analysis or epidemiological trends and so forth, right? But that comes from us being, I'm sorry, in the realm of freedom by and large, or at least in the realm of social reproduction, if you really want to kind of be middle groundish about it. So in that sense, I do agree that this, that the questions like this have attracted the attention of people on the left. I just think they're asking them in the wrong register. Intuitively, if you go to a person who is now struggling in subsistence and you ask them, is it either the realm of necessity that should, uh, you know, be covered first or should we immediately jump into the realm of freedom? I'm pretty sure that the first will say, oh, please, let's start with the realm of necessity, you know? So it's sure, sure, sure. But this is, but, but again, like if you, if you were to talk longer, like, uh, I mean, you're still recording. I mean, I can tell you that I don't think that that dichotomy is accurate. So I don't think that that's the correct way to think about it. You're not going to get very far if you really pose the question this way, because once you start with both of them separated like that, which assumes a division between work and non-work that's very strict, that separate, that things that value is produced in the workplace, of course, you're going to end up with the most obvious conclusion. So me personally, I and I think I even said it in the Berkeley talk or in some other talk, I, I don't think that that's a helpful way to think about it. So we need to get away from the separation mm. because most of the people on the left then who did think about the realm of freedom, they they still end up saying that we need to reintroduce the realm of freedom into the realm of necessity. The way Marcuse would, would, would for example, he will tell you, oh, factory work should be like a playground. <laughs> <laughs> and I just don't think that you, you're going to end up in a, helpful, uh, in a helpful way. But just to counter back to what you said, if you stick with my analysis, then... You can say that, well, I mean, why is that person starving? I mean, if you really build a system on my model, the money that currently ends up with Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg will be funding uh, his welfare, right? Because that money right now, I mean, his, my realm of freedom, if not his, is being expropriated, appropriated, and monetized in a way that leaves that person starving. So why is that a trivial issue? And I don't know what the right answer is. It doesn't seem to me trivial. It seems to me that clearly once you understand that the rise of big tech to some extent is linked to the ability to tap into everyday life and to tap into our social coordination with each other and to monetize it and extract profits from it and to strip uh, public coffers of the revenues that would have otherwise been there, then yeah, I mean, I don't think it's such an unreasonable question to ask. So of course, that's why I was saying when, when earlier that I don't think that this is the right paradigm, for example, for the global South, where you still probably need to be building factories and have people working there. You need to industrialize, you need to build your own base, you need to recreate, instead of relying on global supply chains, recreate some of the capacity domestically. It will be fine with the older socialist program. Mm -hmm. So I understand the geopolitical and regional bias, what I'm saying, but I don't think that the fact that there are, uh, I don't think that the fact that there are, you know, people who are poor or homeless or uh, who have troubles right now, which can be immediately resolved, uh, should take off pressure of us to find holes in legitimation strategies of neoliberals because I, or contribute to articulating an art, uh, uh, alternative political project because the fact that people are hungry right now stripped of the ideological context tells you absolutely nothing you might as well believe that elon musk should give them basic income or uh, some philanthropist should fund something for them right so to me the presence of evil in the world as such, that is easily fixable, it's no reason not to engage, which I think we both agree on that, but I just want to reiterate it because, like, for me, they're not somehow, 
one is not the reason not to think about the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, no, I, I absolutely agree with that. Um, it's uh, maybe it's that I think about the ability to bring about the new in different ways. Or so maybe I don't, I don't see it as that much of a challenge. But I, 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 I think I, I, I get the point you're making. At least I, I think I get the point you're making in terms of uh, providing. That was the project, but that was the project for Marx, though. So I mean, I really think that if you if like, yeah, what is Marx? What is Marxism? Marxism is very simple. You have uh, social relations of production that eventually block forces of production from advancing further. It's, it's just a philosophy of the new. There is nothing else in Marx. Like that's the core idea. It's that, and that you need to change relation. You need to change relations of production so that the forces of production can continue unimpeded. And you can of course make all sorts of cases for ecology and whatever, and they're all impor uh, important points. But ultimately, that's what it is. So, I mean, the question of the new and its sustained, almost industrial, methodological, theoretical production, it's at the core of the leftist project. Uh, yes, but there are a lot of questions that are connected to that. The question of if we needed to think pro uh, progressivism in a different way, for example, I'm not sure if we if we can just you know jump into this um, competition, so to speak, with the neoliberals and accept this premise in the first place of uh, markets as the uh, harbingers of uh, the production of the new, and then try to. Um, But this is where we yeah that, mm -hmm. that's where we disagree. I think yeah because I think yeah, it's just yeah, undeniable. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's undeniable. I also think phenomenologically for the majority of the population. That's so interesting. I mean, I you mean, just need to open an app store. I mean, don't you see all the apps? I mean, how you can possibly deny that that's the production of the new? I mean, that's what people think. Well, the I mean, there's I mean, an what, argument. Like, well, there's a, there's a strong argument to make that capitalism is like the the production of the ever old in new forms. You know, that's one. That's an argument that that is out there, and it has some form of plausibility to it as well. No, that the the way in which sure. the way in which uh, markets and capitalism. Uh, are able to produce the news is uh, is a very very narrow corridor in which we have this like uh, accelerated uh, perpetuation of the old actually and not really the production of the new which is i think the what you actually want to state or what you are stating you know so I'm, maybe we are not um mm -hmm. Not a part in no, this. No, no, no. But no, no. I believe in productivity improvements. So I believe that there are productivity improvements in capitalist firms that are real. So they're not inventions. If they were just the recycling of the old, like there is no reason for capitalist firms to fake the production of productivity improvements. Because if they do that, they're just going to be eaten alive. In that sense, I do believe in competition. Yeah. But it's but that's that's why I mentioned that that it's also important to talk about new ways of thinking about progress because it's not only about productivity improvements, no, because the the this way of thinking, this way, uh, this logic sure, has sure, sure. brought us sure, into a, a place where we are uh, saying that they're just repackaging the through old. Uh, at yeah, catastrophe. Yeah, yeah, but that's a different. But that's a different argument from saying that they're repackaging the old. So if you. I was invoking that in the sense that I don't think they're repackaging the old because if they're repackaging the old, they'll just be out of business as individual capitalists. And in that sense, I think if you read somebody like Anwar Shaikh, yeah, who I think is the Marxist economist who's done it, like his view on competition is the same as mine and is mm -hmm. the same to some extent as Hayek's. So competition is real and it does produce new things both on the consumption side and on the production side. You can make all sorts of arguments, and like, and that's partly what I'm saying that there are other ways in which new is generated because there are other ways in which we coordinate. And so far, we've put all of our resources, all of our thinking, and money and laws into boosting markets as the only infrastructure of doing that. But clearly, that's not the only infrastructure. But to me, it seems. And we need it for all sorts of reasons that I accept that have to do with the redefining progress and, and, and so forth. But to me, to deny that there is something new produced in the markets by both producers and consumers, and that is valid, and that that part of the neoliberal argument is correct, it just to me seems counterproductive yeah. because it just rejects our phenomenological everyday like experience. And I think it kind of like 
Did he, I see no problem in accepting that? Part yeah, of the yeah, story. yeah. No, well, I mean, it's uh, uh, <laughs> I, that's if you state it this way, then then I I wouldn't say that there is nothing new being produced. But that's actually bringing us to a question that I wanted to ask you, but I actually didn't because maybe you could specify what you mean by the new. Is it just productivity gains? So if mm -hmm. you talk about the that that has to be replaced when it comes. To, to this question of the production of the new. What is the new? How do you define it? Well, but I mean, does it need to be defined? Well, it, may, it, it makes a big difference. I mean, yeah. if you look at it in terms of practices, these are practices and ways of being and ways of, yeah, existing that were not there before when you started. I mean, you just need to introduce a temporal element in this, and you're going to see practices that and ways of doing things that were not there before, or ways of doing old things in new ways, or uh, ways of doing completely new things. I mean, what's the... But that's being, I mean, the, the, the new is being, in, if you define it in this way, the new is being produced in many different social fields all the time, everywhere. But who's denying that? But, but, yeah, oh. but who's denying that? Like you're telling me things no, have no, no, been no. Like, <laughs> that are the core of my argument and I'm trying to build an infrastructure for scaling them up and generating value out of them. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. I think it's just that uh, I think why, <laughs> why we land at this position is that I'm not sure if the thing that market competition is able to provide when it comes to building the new is as huge as as you or it, it should be problematized much more than than maybe you would do it but i think we're circling around uh in in different ways yeah but it also depends i mean look uh, like it, it it depends on what your project is like if you it depends on how you think about Now, liberalism, I don't think about this as an economic theory. Mm. I think about it as a theory of modernity. I think about it as a theory of civilization, essentially. Mm. That tells you precisely, I'm sorry to say, how do you incorporate the new into your life and into the into the world? You know, and and and, and like if you read Hayek, it's just there stated very clearly. That yes, he tells you there are all sorts of effects if you put the cash nexus where you previously had social relations or family ties, but in the long run, the pie expands. And the pie expands even if certain people end up as losers. And it expands precisely because this new stuff is being produced and it's being produced in a sustainable way as far as capitalism is concerned. We don't talk about climate and other things. And this is what market civilization does. It's not about coordinated firms and consumers. It's about bringing novelty into the world. And I don't know, like, how is that not, to me, and if you look at the legitimation of neoliberalism, that's the reason why it's of any appeal, unless it's imposed by force, that is the most exciting part of neoliberalism, which is so exciting that social democrats are buying into it. And if you really want to uh, unthrone it or dethrone it, you need to have an alternative account of how society can move forward and structurally, infrastructurally, produce the new in a way that scales up and that's not just about arts and crafts and artisanal people building things, but that there are actually ways to interconnect people in, I don't know, Ecuador with people in Moldova, which is what the market does. And make sure the changes in one praxis then are reflected in the uh, life and in the praxis of the other. Ultimately, what I'm saying is that there are infrastructures that allow people to coordinate, collaborate, produce things, whether these things are effects or emotions or ideas or things that have all of the markings of what neoliberals attribute to market civilization without most of the costs. And that if you, they're not developed because public policy is such that it doesn't channel resources there. You cannot scale them up properly. You cannot, your only turn, your only option is towards the market. Mm. 
right? And that's why we have all these idealistic people who, beyond protesting, if they really want to do something, like what do they do? Like they form a startup and they become, you know, in, in most cases, and they seek money and they know that this will allow them to scale. If they don't want to be just local operators and if they want to scale, that's what they need to do. Why? Because our entire civilization favors the market as the default and only infrastructure of scaling up this coordination and generating value out of it. But you can have a multiplicity of them. That's why in one of my earlier articles in New Left Review, I basically said, look, Hayek has a flawed evolutionary theory and what he says about how people become less altruistic as they move from villages to cities is wrong. That evolutionary theory actually teaches us otherwise. And that you might as well say that this that solidarity will be as productive, what Hayek calls discovery, as competition. It's, it's basically like there is no reason to believe that he's correct on that point, and I don't think he is. But it doesn't mean that solidarity is the only thing that can do it. You can maybe list 10 values that will do it. Maybe you can list 20, and maybe you can list infrastructures that will go along with them to enable them and to elicit these behaviors and to elicit these orientations. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't know. To me, that seems like the core question of how do you organize modernity Rather than a trivial one, it's not about uh, making sure we have a different system for building apps. It's 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 a way for me of thinking about how do you move society forward and embrace the new in a structured way that bypasses the dichotomy of the market and the state and refuses the idea that the only way to do it in a scaled up way is by relying on the market. I absolutely agree. I think it's maybe because I, maybe you are holding something back that is in the book and in your thinking because there's something missing. I absolutely agree with everything you just said. But um, for example, within capitalism, you do have private property as a form of guiding lens, you know, that is able to unify these actions much as the uh, market as competition does you know so, so you will have a mechanism that is able to provide a form of like pre-coordination maybe and in the way that you describe the alternative i think of course it's right to point out that there um, needs to be a multiplicity of different approaches that look at different aspects of, for example, the market, but also different um, like um, regional contexts and stuff like that. But then still you would have to uh, come up with an answer that provides this glue, this um, form of um, uh, maybe directionality that is provided in capitalism through private property and markets as competition, uh, you would have to find a different form of um, mechanism for the production of pre-configuration, so to speak, for the alternative. No, 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 but no, I, I don't think so. I, ah, I, I don't even think it's my problem. Mm -hmm. uh, no, because I, wh why? Because we're not trying to build, in that sense, I, I depart from describing what so far we have been talking about for the last 10 minutes as a socialism. Because if you really wanted to, it's a non-capitalism at best, what I'm describing. And as a non-capitalism, it's not post-capitalism, it's a non-capitalism. And, you know, and if you really want to go really far, you can say that you can have a multiplicity of non-capitalisms. And I don't think that it requires any grounding, for example, in an alternative property regime. Like, I don't. You might argue that it would require certain rights to preserve those forms of right, to preserve those forms of life. You might argue that you would need a right to ignorance of something because that would be the only way to preserve certain core features. We might argue you would need some kind of an institutional slack so that you don't over-optimize. But to generalize it to a theory that as a guiding lens here would be to convert it into an ism which is not what I'm trying to do. So at best, my ism is a non-ism and it's a non-capitalism. Nice.
Good answer. <laughs> Even though I'm not uh, uh, saying that it n would need to be a different form of property regime that would provide this type of glue that I'm I'm talking about, but um, but also, but, but I think you're also different. mistaken with regard. I also think you're mistaken with regards to property. To be honest, but I can easily imagine, and in fact, it exists. You can have capitalist relations now, uh, where property would be very different from the one we have property regime and where it wouldn't uh you would be able to look at the radical markets people mm. uh like what they think <laughs> if, if 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 a certain uh piece of equipment uh is not used well by the capitalists who owns it we're just gonna come in and take it <laughs> and to put it on the auction yeah. and somebody will come in and buy it like that's complete violation of the private property that you think is constitutive of capitalism and i just don't think that for them it's constitutive of capitalism uh -huh. fair enough good point <laughs> <laughs> okay Fine. so though, i don't so think thanks. i'm holding back <laughs> like to me like sorry maybe i'm just yeah. in my bubble uh, to me it seems pretty like obvious i would know like look i live in a village here like reading i mean look <laughs> at my books here i mean it's like it's not exactly the most exciting reading you have here like you know uh, uh, ludwig von mises human action. <laughs> but i mean so it's possible i live in a bubble here but oh come on who are you I, kidding I, I, I do think that there is something there let's put it that way <laughs> oh uh, well, well well i mean who are you kidding the the, the you're the you're the person uh monitoring like all the discourses most closely so if anybody um, is kind of guarded against being too much in a bubble. I think it's you, Evgeny. So I'm, um, <laughs> it's it's fair enough to say that there is uh, a lot there, I think. Fine. Evgeny, thank you so much for being part of Future Histories. Sure, my pleasure. That was our show for today. Thanks a lot for listening. If you want to support Future Histories, you can do so on Patreon. For this, visit patreon.com slash futurehistories or you can simply tell a friend that you liked the show and that he, she or they might like it as well. Thanks a lot and hear you in two weeks.